try one more time for the slow people in the room. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob. Hi, Bob. Bob, Bob I need validation. I have trouble. I have some self-esteem issues, so please greet me warmly. I need it. All right. So my name is Bob Jensen, and I'm part of the 5604 Mainer gang. <coughs> Some of you have been here before. If not, 5604 Mainer is a collaborative project of the Workers' Defense Project, which is a worker, Im an immigrant worker advocacy group, and Third Coast Activist Resource Center, which is a group I'm part of, which does public education around global justice issues. We also have offices for a group called Cooperation Texas, which does great work for people who want to start worker-owned, worker-run businesses, worker cooperatives. So uh, if you have a time during a break and want to tour our backyard. We also have a great community garden project going in the back. Uh, so welcome. Um, before we get going with the program, if anybody is not on our, on our mailing list for the Third Coast Activist Resource Center, feel free to sign up on your way out. It's one email a week, Monday morning, that lets you know what's going on in town in progressive politics. So uh, with that, all I have to do today is uh, turn it over to our guest presenter, Jack from the Austin Chronicle, who graciously volunteered to do a seminar on photography for activists, helping us figure out how to use all of these new machines that are in our pockets and in our bags and use them more effectively. So uh, I'm just going to turn it over to him. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, everybody, my name is John Anderson. Everybody calls me Jack. It's my nickname. Feel free to call me either one. Um, I'm a staff photographer at the Austin Chronicle. Um, for a little more background, I've been doing this for about 25 years. I first started photography in uh, 85. Went to school, did some work as well. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., so I went to school there. Um, kind of cut my teeth on covering a lot of the protests and rallies in D.C. And like every weekend there's at least something usually. So I got used to doing that. Um, came down to Austin to, stu to study at UT. Graduated there in 95 with a BA in, in photojournalism. And worked with the Chronicle about the same time. They put me on staff in 2000. And um, I do a lot of the well, cover just about everything they cover, so not just news, but food and music and stuff. So, um, I started with the Occupy Austin um, coverage. Well, it started when Occupy Wall Street started, and I, you know, initially I, I was really moved by it because it struck with me a lot of what I felt about, you know, the corporate takeover of our government and so forth. So I. Right away, I thought, wow, I'd love to go up to New York, but I didn't really have the resources to uh, spend that kind of time in New York um, indefinitely. So when Occupy Austin started, I thought, this is great. It's, it's here. It's come to me. And then one of our editors um, decided we should do a photo gallery on this. So I got a, an assignment with no end to it, <laughs> which at the time felt a little uneasy. But it was something I wanted to cover. so. Um, that worked out great. I, I really got into it. I sort of caught up in the movement, although still stayed a journalist covering it. And I think that's an important distinction we'll talk about some later. Um, and turned out the assignment was just something I took on on my own and just kept going with it. And it's still in. Um, so that's my background. That's how I got to this point here today. Um, what we're going to cover today, we're going to start with the mechanics of making photos. Um, just the nuts and bolts of it. Then we'll move on to elements that make a good photo, the aesthetics of it. Um, you know, what you want to bring, what you're thinking about shooting when, uh, when you put together a photo. Um, and then we'll move on, we'll sh I'll show some of my work and We'll, uh, we'll talk about um, the elements that I, well, I'm going to make a list, and we'll talk about how I bring those together in a photo. Um, after the images, maybe we'll take a break to how we're doing on time. Um, I'll talk some about post-processing, archiving, uh, and then we'll move 
to uh, ethical and legal concerns dealing with the police and, and so forth. And, and just photographing um, people in general. And uh, as I mentioned, activism and journalism. journalism. So it's a, a lot to cover. Um, could probably do this in a semester, a college semester, so we're going to cram a lot in here. Um, feel free to ask questions if anybody has questions. Just raise your hand, shout out. Um, and so I'll start with getting a show of hands. How many people have um, a digital SLR or an SLR, a regular camera with a lens like, like this? There's a few people. Okay, good. Um, out of those folks, do any of you use it in manual exposure mode all the time? All the time? Yeah, or well, regularly. Regularly, okay, most people. Because I wanted to start with, and I don't know how much we have to dwell on this, shutters and aperture, just real basic stuff. Does this, this really want to go over that? And how to make proper exposures. Um, it's important. I think, and most professionals too, or I don't know any professionals, that use their camera in, in an automatic exposure mode. It's always manual. It gives you full control over what you're doing. If I were to be using a manual exposure in my camera, it would feel like someone I was driving and someone had their another foot on the breaker pedals. It just wouldn't feel right to me. So um, we'll go over how to do manual exposures because ideally that's what you want to learn to work with so that you always have control of your, your shutter speed and your aperture setting. Um, the way I learned it in school, and I think this is the best way to do it, is imagine, um, a sink with a faucet. and a handle up here. So we'll think about the water as light. So when we want a proper exposure, let's just say it's right here, and what's proper is somewhat subjective, but we want exposure not too light, not too dark, something that you feel represents what you saw. So this would be, this represents the water, of a proper exposure, we'll say it's you know, about right here. Um, so we have two factors in controlling exposure. There's the shutter speed, which we can think of as the handle that we open, and the amount of time we have it open controls how much water flows through here. So to relate it to shutter speeds, we could have it at 1 15th of a second, we could have it at 1 25th, um, 1 250th of a second. Um, this is slower, this is faster. This would be leaving that faucet open a little bit longer, letting water in. This would be like a quick burst. So that is your shutter. Your aperture you can think of as the opening to the faucet. And you could have either a little one or, or really big. And so obviously if you have a little opening, just a little bit of water is going to come through. If you have a big one, a whole lot of water is coming through, or light. So we control the exposure through the amount of light and the amount of time. So the shutter is the time. The aperture, which is a, I should explain, is a, a ring in the lens. We've probably all seen this before. It has little metal uh, leafs. And it, and it opens and closes. You can close it down real small, you can open it up nice and big. Little bit of light, a lot of light. So those are the two factors controlling a, a, a normal exposure. Um, and on our cameras, we have a setting, or it used to be with film, you could buy slow film or fast film on a camera and with the camera. It's called an ISO setting. And we don't really need to know that it stands for. It's international standardization or something like that. Anyway, so that sets the speed or the sensitivity that your camera or film has to light. 
So a low ISO, let's say 200, um, is what you'd like want to use when it's really sunny. Your camera or film doesn't have to be as sensitive to the light as a higher ISO, let's say 3200, which is more sensitive to the light. Does that make, does that make sense to everybody? So you set it higher. So, so one way to think of it is a higher setting, you don't need as much light or water. You know, higher settings down here, if that's, if that makes sense. Um, but I think the important takeaway here is we're talking about the amount of time and the amount of light. And you can adjust those together. A short amount of time over here, more light coming through makes the same exposure as a longer amount of time and less light coming through. That makes sense. Um, so it's important to, to know how that works. What do I do with my water? Because these settings have um, different effects on your photos. Um, if you use too slow of a shutter speed, you're likely to get blur or, or motion, people moving around or whatever, a car or something, you'll see that blurring effect if the shutter speed is too slow. Um, your aperture also controls what's called depth of field, and that's the area on which is in focus. You can think of it as, as a narrow area or a real wide area out from what, where you're seeing. A small aperture will create a wider depth of field. A larger aperture will make a narrower depth of field. Real. And, and I'm going to show photos, so you know we'll we'll, we'll see examples of, of that to make um, make sense of that. Um, I think we got that covered. Are there, are there questions about exposure? We can expose them. Awesome. Um, let's see, we got to that. I think so. Okay. So, another factor here, and it comes into play with the shutter speed, but it's also important to know, is the focal length of lenses. Probably, most cameras these days come with a zoom lens. Probably everybody. As one other. You can still buy fixed lenses, but most people have zooms. And so a wide focal length of the lens would be with, with your zoom wide open, so you can see as much as you, or the widest view that you can. Uh, a zoom would be, um, you know, more of a telephoto. It's the longer, and, and you know, you're going to zoom in on one little part. Um, What's important to remember about that in relation to the shutter speeds is there's a rule of thumb um, that you don't want the shutter, this bottom denominator, to go below the focal length of the lens. And so I'll give you an example. Um, a 28 millimeter lens, um, <laughs> um, is considered a wide lens. And the wider the lens, the easier it is to hold the camera steady and not get that blur. And so if we're shooting with a 28, ideally you don't want to go be below 1 30th of a second for, um, for a shutter speed. Below that and, you know, 1 15th, 1 8th, slower, you're liable to get blur either from your camera shaking or from movement or, or whatever. So, um, and then, and, and conversely, when you move up to say a 200 millimeter lens, which is a long lens, um, you don't want to drop below, you know, one 200 or one 250. It's because of the longer lens, it's more likely to blur than a wider lens. Um, and we'll get to more about how to use the lenses and, and um, 
you know, for making different kinds of photos. But I wanted to make sure that we got sort of the nuts and bolts here out of the way. Um, I think we've got it covered. Any questions on that? Wow, good deal. Um, Because I didn't want to spend too much time dwelling on this stuff. Um, so what I want to talk about next, to me, is the kind of the important stuff. This, I mean, it's it's important to know this, but I don't think about it much. So we'll we'll talk about um, what makes a good photo. I think the first thing for me to start with is just a word. And, um, you know, this may be too obvious, but it's important to remember this. Photograph, um, two words, light, writing. And that's what we're doing, writing with light. It may seem obvious, but it's, it's important to keep that in your head. Um, because, and, and we'll go, when we go through the Kind of emphasize that. We'll see. Um, I think one of the the hardest things for people is is learning to actually see what is in front of you, learning to see the light. Um, I see a lot of times people, you know, they'll, they'll photograph Grandma or whatever, and the sun will be behind her, and she's just in complete shade, and they're thinking to themselves like, you know, that's that's Grandma, that's you know, I'm taking a picture, I've got her in the frame, but they're not actually looking <laughs> to see that she's in complete shadow, you know. And so when they get the picture back, it's, you know, how did this happen? So an awful lot of photography is just learning to see the light and learn, you know. And you can also use um, sort of rules of thumb, like put the sun behind you. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to do that. There's ways of breaking the rules, but that's one little rule of thumb is that the sun's over your shoulder, your subject's going to be well lit. Um, but better is to just is to learn to see it, because then you don't have to necessarily rely on, on things like that. Um, so we'll start listing some of the elements of a good photo. Um, like we just said, you know, let's use a different So, light, the quality of the light, um, how much light there is, um, the direction it's coming from, uh, you know, is it hard, bright sunlight, is it soft shadows, um, that's an element. The other is what a photographer um, named Carte Bressant, famous photographer, used to call the decisive moment. And that is the moment when you see the picture. He would, you know, he'd say, you know, could see it happening, and when you shot it, you had a certain feeling, that's it. That's the moment. And he was known for that, for capturing certain moments, either it be, you know, a gesture or, or you know, usually it was human gestures. That, you know, created a moment. And that gets back to um, what we were talking about with the shutter speed. So it's it's um, one of the things I like to think about with photography is that you're in a time-space continuum. And so you, you have your own place in space, and then you have your own experience of time. We all experience that we think of ourselves moving through it. But your own space in that time continuum is unique to yourself. And so no one else is going to take the same photo. It's going to be your unique perspective. And so where you position yourself and what time you choose to take that picture is your unique perspective. Um, so the decisive moment or the, you know, the time you shoot is another element. Um, composition. How uh, you arrange uh, uh, arrange the um, the elements of the photo. How you arrange them? Do you, you want it real balanced looking? Do you want it sort of off balance? Um, 
uh, you know, to, to emphasize certain things. So it's, this kind of gets back to the writing, photo writing, composition. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Um, and related to composition is how you frame your subject. One of the, the common uh, mistakes I see people make is um, they, don't, they don't think of the photograph as a whole frame and using the edges of the frame. To get an example of taking pictures of grandma, they just stick grandma in the frame and tend to, you know, you have your frame here, just put her face right in the middle and, you know, just stand right there. And then there's, so there's all this space around her unless they did a nice job, that space isn't really being used compositionally, if that makes sense. Um, and, to, well, elaborate a little bit on composition. Um, part of the uh, of comp composition is thinking of negative and positive space. In this case, we think of the person as the positive space, and I don't mean that in a judgmental way, but um, it's the space that your eye is drawn to. The negative space would be you know, the rest of the image. The space that um, is not really the subject matter, but it plays into the composition. And you do that by being aware of how you frame a subject. And, you know, a better way of doing this would, would have been, or, well, in my mind, Lots of, it's very subjective, of course. Would be, you know, to kind of fill the frame, you know, at least, you know, use some space around here rather than just a lot of empty space. I'm like put it over on this side or whatever. But um, it's about thinking about it as a, as a whole image rather than just one subject in the image. If that makes sense think of the, and, and you really think of it as using the edges to create the composition. Um, and you know, some of these are real basic stuff. You might see it in, you know, an old, you know, Kodak Moments handbook or something, or popular photography. But when we go through this list, what you'll see is um, the best pictures will have a number of these elements in one photo. And that's the secret, that's the trick. So, for example, the next one we'll talk about is foreground, middle ground, background. And maybe people have heard about, you know, doing that before. It's, so you have uh, foreground, middle, back. So you have something in the front. I photograph people a lot, so think of it as a, as a person in the front. Um, you have something in the middle, say, you know, crowd marching and then something in the back, the Capitol, you know, or something like that, people marching down Congress. And what that does is it gives your photograph some depth and leads your eye into the photo. And that's something, you know, we'll, we'll talk about a lot is, and that's uh, it's a, it's a great way of, of learning by looking at other people's pictures, is letting your eye wander through the photo and paying attention where it goes and why it goes that way. We'll, we'll see that some more. Um, but again, foreground, middle, back creates depth to your photos, um, makes it more interesting. All of these things make for more interesting photos. Um, maybe this is a subsection of composition, but I'll throw it up here. Using shapes. Uh, lines, patterns, you know, like repeating patterns um, are, are elements. Uh, another thing people like to talk about is the, the rule of thirds. Um, and rules are always made to be broken, of course. But um, they, uh, I, I use this a lot, and I don't do it intentionally, but it just looks good to me. Um, we, we tell you the, the rule of thirds, this isn't exactly proportional, but 
Um, you take a frame, and this gets back to the framing, and you divide it up into thirds this way, and then um, two this way. It relates to a, um, the standard 35 millimeter frame, and, and most everybody, if you have a DSLR, you know, like this, it's this standard frame, and it's at a two to three ratio. And, and that's what we see here, is there's three this way, there's two that way. So using this, to, and you can put elements in, you know, in this square, or down here, up here. It, it's a way of creating photos that are more interesting than just putting it, your subject matter or whatever it is just smack dab in the middle. Compositionally, it, there's something about it for our eye that it looks a little, for me anyway, and I have my own style, everybody kind of has their own way of doing this, um, but for me, I, I kind of like things to be off-centered a lot. Um, it creates more emphasis than just having a real um, kind of graphically flat photo, if that makes sense. Um, so, and, and, and I'll show this, when we look at pictures, we'll, we'll show how, how this works. But, so this is another sort of tool of composition. Um, and another one, this gets back to what I was saying about your unique perspective. The perspective you take your photograph from, whether that be shooting low, um, a lot of times when I'm shooting marches, I'll shoot, you know, maybe looking through my camera, I'm shooting up high, though I've practiced that a lot of the years. <laughs> There's tricks to it. Um, but that helps create different, well, it's different perspectives, so you can make more interesting photos that way. Um, and it also allows you to do different things. I'll show some where I want a, a event where I shot some real low, I shot some real high. Same event, completely different type of photos. Um, and that's one way of, if you're covering something, really mixing it up. You know, think about, you know, your angles, where you're shooting from. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, sometimes I'll get bored, I'm shooting something and I'll realize, you know, I need to get in a different spot. This is just getting boring for me. And I'll just see, what does it look like from over here or over here or whatever. And changing the perspective, um, or the perspective in general is, is an important element. Um, and along with that goes the usage of, of different lenses um, also creates a different perspective. Um, if we're using a wide lens, um, you know, clearly, and you know, we'll get to the pictures, but you know, you'll see a much wider area um, than you would with a telephoto, a very different type of perspective. With wider lens, it's often it's easier to create the foreground, middle ground, background I was talking about. You, you have a nice wide space to work with. But you can do that with long lenses too. Um, so using lenses is a way of doing perspective other than moving your body around. Um, and then there, there's other things, you know, like color, black and white, you know, you can, you know, whichever you want to go with, those are elements of a photo. Things like contrast in the image, whether it's, it's flat, kind of a flat image or very contrasty, you will see some examples. Um, emotion is another thing to add. Um, which is great for activist work because there's usually a lot of human emotion. Um, and then choosing content. <coughs> and for me, this is, is, a, is a critical part of photojournalism is choosing content that tells the story. Um, the certain elements that you decide need to be in the photo to, to tell the story. Um, and, it's, and it's how we create meaning in, in images, is by combining those elements. And, and a lot of that involves really thinking about what it is you're shooting, being aware of what's going on. 
And um, it's one of the things that I think, I mean, I, I work as a, as a photojournalist. I, I don't involve myself in the organizing of activism. Um, some of the folks here know that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm close, but I draw a line between um, organizing and you know, or speaking, even chanting, or even fist raising, or anything. And the reason for that is it gives me a certain perspective that allows me to pay attention to the content of what's going on that I think sometimes when people are in the middle of it, they miss. Um, it's just, and, and I've seen folks that try and do both, and I think it, it can be hard. You're distracted in both ways. So, if you think of yourself as an activist when you want to cover an event, I think it's worth going in mentally and thinking, all right, I'm going to cover this and not participate in it. Now, I've, I've seen people that have said they're going to do that, and then they get slipped up in the action and everything, and, you know, whatever. But for me, um, that's an important distinction, and it helps me choose the content. Um, so we have all these, this list of all this stuff, and, and like I said, you know, some of this can be out of, you know, capturing your Kodak moment handbook or whatever. But the secret, the trick for me is you, you want to combine as many of these elements as you can. And the more you can put together in a photo, the stronger the image. And this applies to photography in general, not just photojournalism. It's, it applies to art photography. It applies to commercial photography. Um, and, you know, particularly these first three. The light, the moment, which is a little bit more important than journalism, but still, it's an important part of photography and composition and framing. But these others are important elements, too. And the more you can bring in, you know, like foreground, background, um, really nice light, um, capturing a moment at the same time, having a strong composition, um, maybe some repeating patterns. You can put all that into one photo, and you've got a good photo. I mean, it's, it's almost a, a no-brainer that way. It's um, sort of, you know, all right, sorry. <laughs> it's, 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 it really is just a matter of, of, of learning these. There's, there's, you could probably come up with some more, but these are sort of the major ones. Um, any questions? What do you mean by repeating patterns? So, um, well, we'll show some, but uh, certain shapes, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I don't know if this is a good one, but let's say a building has some unusual windows to it. And they, you know, make a, there's a certain, I mean, you know, they're in line or whatever. And you use that as an element in the background or something just to create um, it's something that draws your eye into the photo and moves around the photo I, it's just something the way our, our eyes respond to patterns you know like they want to make sense of what they're seeing and patterns is one way of doing that it's a it's really a visual element to make things more pleasing uh, there's a couple examples and we can show you we can show you that um, any other Questions? On the uh, rule of thirds, Jack, yeah. I've noticed on mine uh, you can actually uh, slap that uh, uh, yeah. two line, like grid. two line grid up yeah. on the objective. Uh -huh. So you're actually seeing it when you're. Do you use that, or is it so ingrained now? That it's ingrained. It's there? I mean, I just see it. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I, like I said, I'm not even really thinking in this way, but I do it. <laughs> you know. I mean, I learned that, but it. I mean, I'm not consciously thinking, oh, I got to put that person on this side or this side. It's just, it's just intuitive. Um, and it, I, you know, it's, for me, it's kind of a natural way of composing. But yeah, I don't, I don't use it that way. I'd probably get distracted for me. I just feel like it. Any other questions? Yeah. For, um, so if you don't want to lug your SLR around, you've got your camera phone. Um, it seems to me it'd be easier to use the the rule of thirds if your camera phone is facing horizontally versus vertically. No, no, no. That that works both ways. That can that can go vertically too. Um, 
same thing, and and it can work the same way. And so it, it's you know, horizontal or vertical, you still have it divided in the same way. It's the two to three ratio. It's now, you know, some cameras like point and shoots don't have that ratio, but like standard 35 millimeter, and it's it's uh, it's a nice ratio to compose with, like that or squares. Any questions? I have a comment about that, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I work for TV, uh -huh. <laughs> and TV hates the vertical. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> they hate that, and they get I, that all the time. Oh yeah, these days with the camera phones, yeah, I, it drives me nuts. So when I see creepy that. is great. <laughs> when I see that, um, yeah, for video, yeah, you always want to short, shoot horizontally, and and I don't know what people possess. You know, that's an example of people not really looking and thinking about what it is they're they're shooting. Um, they're, they're not thinking about, yeah, the video is going to play. Like, we don't go to movie theaters and watch a vertical movie. <laughs> it's just, you know, we don't, it's just visually, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's, a, that, that's people who are used to holding their phones vertically, and that's how they talk, and so that's how they hold it. They're not thinking about the composition, they're not thinking that it's going to be video, and they don't watch vertical videos. And, so it's this. <laughs> We do now because people make us. Uh, um, Jack, Jack, one more question. Yeah, yeah. Um, it sounds to me like when you're when you're going to say a, a specific action that yeah. activists are have planned and are putting on, right? That when you're there, you're you almost have like a play oh, yeah. running through your mind where you're saying, okay, this is what I'm seeing, right? And and as the as the thing develops, it's like acts of a play, and you're kind of running that and doing your journalism, doing your recording based on kind of what you think the overall thing is going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not expressing that well, but. No, that's, that's accurate. I mean, um, I go into it thinking in my head, you know, what it might look like, what might be going on, you know, whatever. If I can get some knowledge, if, if there's a, if it's a march, and I can find out the root of the march, that's nice. Yeah. And and one of the reasons for that is, I mean, I'll literally plan. If and we'll I'll show pictures of this. If the march is moving around downtown in different directions, and it's a sunny day, and the march is moving north, I'll sometimes just take a break from shooting because the shadows from the buildings and the sun coming from the back sometimes it's just too too hard to make good pictures out of sometimes I mean you can do it and I'll show examples but sometimes I'll just wait until the march turns the corner and then I've got good light and then I'll start shooting you know when we have good light to work with um, or it's the same thing with shadows buildings casting shadows and, you know I'll, I'll see a block and like oh there's a block of shade and, and I'll start hustling up to where the light is and wait for the march to come into the light and position myself there. So that is, I think, is answering what you're, what you're asking about as far but as... But also like the, 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 not just the lighting and composition, but the actual... Uh, coverage. Co uh, the actual meaning of the event, uh, the right. social or the political or whatever it is, you you're kind of running that, it seems to me, you're kind of running that through your head because that oh, depend, yeah. that that kind of dictates what you're going to photograph because you're trying to interpret the event using the photograph. Right, so I'm interpreting the event, you're paying attention to what's going on and look for elements in there that describe what's happening when we look at some pictures. So, right, yeah, I mean, I, I go in, you know, already knowing or thinking, you know, about, okay, so this is going to be a march, it's going in this direction, that direction, what's the march about, you know, so look for signs that are relevant, they're not always relevant, that's what they know, you look for signs that are relevant, um, you know, anything that helps tell the story, I mean, we'll, like I said, we'll get to some of that, and, um, and that, that may be the best way of, of doing this, like showing. Any other questions before we do that? Okay. 
All right. Well, when we look at some photos, really, I think this is probably the best way to do it than um, me standing up there talking. So, does anyone want to hit the lights? A march on uh, South Congress early. These are all from Occupy Austin, by the way. It's just been a project that I've been working on. I've, I've done um, lots of, as I mentioned, lots of protests in the past. Um, but Occupy really grabbed. It grabbed my attention, not just um, for what it was about, but there seemed to be an innate sense of visuals and energy, and I know, there was something that grabbed me about it that way. I, I mean, I felt the energy that was greater than um, other stuff I experienced in the past. And the signs were great and, and so forth. So, so all these are with Occupy Austin, and so we'll just preface with that. Um, Jeff, can I ask you one thing? Yeah, sure. Um, when you're shooting like that, what would you say as far as like when you choose to pick a, pic pick a time to take a picture? Are, is it almost every one of them like, okay, this is like the money shot, or are you just more just like taking a bunch and hoping for a good shot? Uh, somewhere in between. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I take a bunch, and, and I'm, I'll, we'll, we'll look at that. I'll show a progression here in a minute. And, but what I'm looking for is the money shot, and I'll just keep working it until I get what I think is the money shot, and then I move. Um, you unless you get lucky, sometimes you get lucky and it Eisenstadt. just happens. I'm sorry. Eisenstadt got lucky with that image that's on a postage stamp now at World War II. The yeah, the, the he didn't even know he took that picture. Right, right. Well, and yeah, I mean there were pictures I took that I didn't know that were significant until I found out later for this guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that. Um, but it was a similar thing. Like I had no idea this was an important photo until it was a backstory. Um, but yeah, sometimes you get lucky. Some, like I mentioned, Carte Brisson and his idea of the decisive moment. I think you know that was that was something that was very important for him. This was back in film, of course, where you don't shoot you know a thousand frames or something. Right. <laughs> so, um, so for him, capturing that moment was was important. And so he would kind of wait. He'd wait for the moment. Whereas for me, I tend, and really when I was shooting film, I would work more that way. I think with digital, we just kind of get used to like click, 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 because we can. Um, and yeah, I've kind of gotten the habit of doing more than that, than the waiting. But I'm still feeling for that moment. And, and I'll be shooting, you know, waiting for something to happen or waiting for all the elements to come together. And then, you know, then it feels right for me. But in some situations, the reason why, you know, sometimes keep shooting is sometimes things don't come together. Right. You know, it's like all and of a sudden right. everybody scatters. Uh -huh. Well, at least I've got something. Oh. You know, like I, I got maybe not the best shot that I would have wanted, but I came away with something. Uh -huh. um, and and I'll show examples of that too. I mean, for me, that's part of my job, is. And not so much this because it's become a personal project, but um, the photos are still on the Chronicle website. There's a gallery. But when I approach it as a job, I, I mean, I've got to come back with something. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally you want it great, but um, you know, I, I have to bring work back. So yeah, I mean, I'll shoot a situation and I feel like, all right, I got the safe shot, and then I'll keep working it to get the money shot. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. And, and we'll go through and see examples of this. So this was, um, I've got three photos here to show. It was all the same location, same march coming down to South Congress. And this is with a very wide angle lens. Um, and so, you know, you, you can see that, you can see how wide it is. And I mean, third. Uh, I think I'm square or whatever. Um, and if you pay attention to your eye, your eye tends to go right there with something to read. Um, and then kind of moves back. 
into the crowd. And, and this is what I'm talking about with the foreground. You could say this is the middle, and then you know the city scape and the background. You could call it background, and you've got the capital right there. Um, and so it creates depth to the photo. It just kind of leads your eye through the photo. Um, so the same situation, oops, not the same situation. Um, here I used a longer lens, same crowd, same location, everybody's coming towards me. Um, and I use a longer lens and you can see the effect it has, it compresses. It's, a, it's kind of the effect that, that long lenses do. It, instead of spreading everything out, it compresses the crowd. And I'll tell you a little trick. Um, when you have a small crowd for an action, this is a good way to make it look like a bigger crowd. <laughs> I mean, this is a good sized crowd, but using a telephoto lens and compressing everybody is, is one way to make it look like there was a bigger crowd. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, compositionally, this is a different photo from the other in that it, it doesn't lead you back. I mean, there's a capital back here, and, and, I, mean, I, and I put it there uh, on purpose. It's, the way it's composed, but I just liked the sort of the wall of, of signs and, and the people. And it's just a, it's a different look from the other photo, um, again, to, to create variety. Um, and then here I'm getting even tighter with a long lens. And instead of having a sort of wall of people, I focus in on this guy and his sign. And, um, and so, and, and use depth of field here, where you can see where he's sharp, and the focus starts falling off behind him. And visually what that does is makes him pop a little bit more out of the photo, you know. Um, he stands out a little bit more. So using that depth of field, um, you can, can make him sharp, everything else not sharp. So were you, uh, were you still placing the Capitol Dome in that yeah. shot? Yeah, I mean, I'm standing in uh, pretty much the same spot. I'm just, switch, I switch lenses and, you know, from a wide to, to a zoom. And, and yeah, I, I, the whole time I had my eye on the, zone, on the dome. Again, to get back to the framing of the photos, yeah, I'm, I'm always aware of the edges of, and, and how the edges um, help create the composition and also what to keep inside the edges. I don't always succeed at it, but I did, did there. So there were, that's um, three examples from almost the same time. Um, at least everybody's on Congress marching this way. And, and, you know, within, you know, a few minutes, you can make three different photos just by changing out lenses. So this is, um, this gets to your, relates to your question as to how I go about um, getting, quote unquote, the money shot. I'm sh showing this picture. I never, never use this for anything. But I'm showing it just to sort of give the context here. Um, it was, it was uh, a group protesting in front of Chase Bank early on. And, um, you, for me, anyway, it doesn't really have the context of a bank. I mean, you can see Chase and says bank in there, but it, it, to me, it, it could be almost anywhere. And it's a group of people sitting on the sidewalk, and you have a cop with a great tattoo there. Um, which to me, is like the only really interesting thing about the picture. But anyway, I show that to, to sort of show the setup of the scene. And so when I decided you know, all right, I want to bring together the elements to tell the story. For me, this, this didn't have the elements. This guy's tattoo stands out the most for me, and that's not what the story was about. So what I did was get down low. I'm going to write where she is. I don't know, she probably moved or something. But I, I got down over here to shoot up for that so that I could put the chase sign in there. So we know that she's in front of a bank. We know that, you know, there's cops. She's talking. She was making a lot of gestures. She was great. Um, a lot of gestures with her hands, very excited. So, you know, for me, that was a moment here. Um, 
and she's doing this. We're in shade, so there's some nice even light. So the light's working well. Um, there's a moment, and then the way the elements are arranged, you know. If, if the chase had been cropped out, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't mean the same. So I, I wanted to make sure I include that chase sign. And then, and you know, I kind of liked that shot, but I kept working it. And then um, this was the shot that I like using. Um, but you can see, it, same situation. I moved over a little bit more. Um, she was raising her fist a lot, so I really wanted to get that. And then caught the moment where she had her fist over Chase, which I, I really liked that. Um, I, I liked the fist over the bank. <laughs> I mean, you can tell that, you know, what, how that means, um, you know, covering up the bank. So I like that. I love the way this guy's looking, you know. And, and, you know, I have to admit, sometimes I don't know if I do this purposefully or not, but I do it a lot, and sometimes put there'll be lines, and there's, there's in other photos, where he, almost this line helps direct the way he's looking. It's just kind of a funny little thing that I tend to do, and I, I don't know if I'm doing it on purpose or not sometimes. <laughs> but, so there's those kind of elements that make a photo. You've got light, composition, uh, a moment. Um, by bringing in these elements, you help create the meaning of the photo. Whereas the other was just sort of a group of people sitting around on the sidewalk and just women talking. This helps tell the story, for me anyway. I don't know, it's subjective. Others might see it differently. But it's an example of pulling together elements to make a photo. So, um, you know, this, the projection is not as great here as we hope, but um, yeah, so the reason I'm showing this, and like I said, if we could see it better, you might notice, but this is an example of finding interesting light. Um, if we notice, the sun is coming down from this angle. You can see it on his shoulder, and the top of his head, back of his shoulder. So the sun's coming down this way. But this was uh, about mid-January, in the middle of the day. The sun is at a certain angle that it hits the W Hotel, big, big building with reflective windows, so that it, the light bounces off the building back into the plaza of City Hall. And so you can see this guy's face is actually lit, whereas if, that, if the W wasn't there, he'd be in just shadow, be dark. And um, there's other places like this downtown, but it's and, and like I said, it's only a certain time of the year, I've, I've noticed, for, for City Hall. But there's other places, too. But it's, for me, it's an example of learning to see the light, you know? Whereas, I mean, I think for a lot of people, they wouldn't have noticed that there's light bouncing off the, the building and filling in. But if you learn to see that light, then um, um, you can take advantage of it. And here's another, another example. Um, again, you can see how well uh, Dave's face is lit. Here, this is the sun. This is the fill light. It's um, it's it's something that you use in studio photography, reflectors to to bounce light because it, it's physics. Light is bouncing off of the building and then um, filling in, um, but. To have that W, I mean, you could never buy a reflector that big. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a real, and to have the sun, I mean, it's just a really neat lighting arrangement. And, um, and, and I, it, it really helps make the, for me, it makes the, the photo work better. Um, again, you know, we've got sort of foreground, middle, and back. Um, you know, if you took out Kathy Tobo, and just had him stand there looking off, that the picture wouldn't have the same meaning. You can tell they're interacting. Um, so you kind of have to include her in the photos. Again, that's, that's a way of um, including elements to tell the story. Um, so here's a, another example. Um, there's, another, there's another spot, spot. this is on Lavaca, where the light was bouncing off the, the window. This is not 
where it was, but this shows you what it can look like in a crappy lighting situation. <laughs> so the sun is coming from over here. You can see it bouncing off his head, and of course he's they're in shadow. And for some, and sometimes this stuff works. I, I've got examples, but for me, you know, I like being able to see what people's faces. You know, this guy is going crazy. It's 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 great to see the emotion in people's faces, and when they're in shadow like that, a lot of times you can't pick that up. On the, yeah. On the previous photo. Yeah. The, on the, the left side. Switch. Sorry. Yeah. Is. Kathy Tobo? Yeah, the, the strip of light on the left side. Is that, is that kind this of here? negative space? Would this you, here? Yeah. Do you like oh, that? yeah. I, you is, know. Is it just there? Yeah, I, that's negative space. It's not really doing much other than, um, I guess, framing up Kathy so she just doesn't disappear off yeah. to the side. But I sometimes see that too. Um, you know, if, if that was really a conscious choice. Yeah, we haven't talked much about negative space. Um, this one, to be honest, doesn't have a lot of negative space working well for it. I was mainly showing this for the light. Okay. We can get to some others where I can show examples of so negative space. So in this space. photograph, how close are you physically to her? Uh, probably about this distance here. It's, it's with, um, this is kind of a medium uh, length lens. I mean, I was using my zoom, but it's probably a medium length, which is average is considered normal, considered 50 millimeter lens. It's probably something like that, maybe a little bit, um, a little bit uh, longer. I'm not sure. But yeah, I mean, I was fairly close. Um, oops, go backwards. So, okay, so here's his march. Lighting not so great, but two blocks up, we get this, um, where, and there's still, you can see the shadow here, but I love how this, the bounce, the sun bouncing off fills in her face. And it's again, you know, example of, uh, you know, learning to, to see the light. Um, and for me, it, it, it just looks a little bit better. But it's, it's, uh, it, it's again, I mean, and, and this would normally be a situation where everybody's backlit, but as I was walking along and I saw that light, I was like, oh wow. So I just stand in that spot as everybody's walking by, <laughs> you know, to use the light. So here's an example of why it's important to learn to um, use manual exposure. Um, if, if you're familiar, you know, with a, light, a situation like this, you could easily overexpose that sign because there's so much darkness. Um, the camera's meter tends to average out the scene. I mean, there's different ways of setting your meter to do different things, but generally speaking, it averages the light in the scene. So you have all this darkness, it'll want to make it brighter, and you lose this sign. When I'm shooting in, uh, you know, bright sunlight, and I always want to expose for the highlights. So I kind of let the shadows go. Um, I, I just usually just set my settings and leave them um, to expose for the, the sun. And that way you, you, don't, you don't get it blown out and you can hold the detail on that sign. And you kind of just let everything else go dark. Um, but that to me is insane. And, and again, we're talking, here's the rule of thirds. Um, Someone asked about patterns. There's kind of some repeating patterns in here, the, the steps. Um, just kind of makes it a little more visually interesting for me. Um, here's an example for me of lighting. I really wish these photos looked better. <laughs> the, the projector has its limitations. Um, so this is an example for me of a really nice light. It's late in the afternoon, what's called or early evening, the, the golden hour. And you can see the, the color of the light, why it's called golden hour. It's, just, it's, warm, it's a warmer light. Um, for me, there's a little moment here. It's kind of hard to tell in this projection. But where these people are embracing, there's, there's kind of that 
a, a moment. Um, again, on the third side over here. Um, as far as negative space, I mean, we could consider this the um, solar panels negative space. I don't know how well they work in this picture, but it kind of frames it a little. Um, a lot of the other negative space in this photo is just has various details that help tell the story and sleeping bags on the steps and so forth. People are about. Um, but I, I like this mainly because of the, the moment and the light. Backlit. The situation that's backlit, 